Germania, Chapter 6, The Perfect Babysitter. The next morning, Sheila cornered my mother on the porch. She had a brilliant idea, idea that she should babysit Fudge and that Mom should pay her. Look at it this way, Mrs. Hatcher, Sheila said, making her case. You're always worrying about him, right? You never know what he might do, and this is supposed to be your vacation. Wouldn't it be nice if you could relax? Remember the last time Sheila babysat Fudge, I told Mom? Remember how he lost his two front teeth trying to fly off the monkey bars? That was years ago, Mrs. Hatcher, Sheila said. Fudge wasn't even three. I took a babysitting course this year. I guarantee satisfaction. No babysitting course could prepare you for Fudge, I argued. But Mom wasn't listening to me. She said, I think you have a good point, Sheila. I would be more relaxed if someone looked after Fudge ever heard of a wife babysitting her husband I asked everyone knows this marriage thing is a joke Sheila said everyone except you Peter yeah what about the groom he thinks it's for real seven dollars a day mom said to Sheila two hours in the morning and four in the afternoon if we need you after supper we'll pay extra it's a deal Sheila said shaking mom's hand and then she skipped off singing hi ho hi ho it's off to work we go about me I asked mom what am I supposed to do while she's babysitting fudge why Peter mom said I thought you'd welcome the chance to have some time to yourself yeah once Jimmy Fargo gets here well maybe you and Sheila can watch fudge together until Jimmy comes together yes together and you'll pay me too I'm paying seven dollars a day mom said I don't care how you split it but Sheila wasn't interesting and she interested in sharing her salary with me it was my idea, she said. Why should I give you half my money? Because he's too much for one person to handle. I can handle anything, Peter. I'm a very responsible person. She turned away from me and called. Fudgy, where are you? I'm here, honey, Fudge called back in his best husband voice. He was sitting on a branch in the swing tree. What are you doing up there? Sheila asked, standing under him. Resting, Fudge said. A bird always rests after breakfast. I've got news for you, I told him. You're not a bird. I'm practicing for when I grow up, he said. You're not going to be a bird when you grow up, I reminded him. I know I'm not going to be a bird, he said, swinging his feet. I'm going to be a bird breather. What's a bird breather, Sheila asked. Someone who breathes for birds. I never heard of that, Sheila said. People don't breathe for birds. That's how much you know, Sheila looked at me. He means a bird breeder, I said. Without me around, she'll never understand him. Oh, a bird breeder, Sheila said. That makes more sense. What makes more sense? Fudge asked. Being a bird breeder, Sheila said. What's a breeder? Fudge asked. Someone who breeds birds and animals, Sheila said. What's breeds? She looked at me again. You wanted to be in charge, I said. You answer his question. It's someone who raises animals, Sheila explained, like a dog breeder raises dogs and a cat breeder raises cats and a bird breeder raises birds. And a baby breeder raises babies, Fudge asked. Not exactly, Sheila told him. Parents raise babies. How come baby breeders don't raise babies? I, I don't know, Sheila said. It just doesn't work that way. I started to laugh. Just wait till she finds out how many questions he asks today. Now come down from that tree, Sheila told Fudge. No. Very well, she said, sounding exactly like our fifth grade teacher. She marched off toward the garage and came back with a ten-foot ladder. Just as she got to the tree, Fudge scrambled down fast as a squirrel. Ha ha, he sang. Fooled you, didn't I? Sheila put her hands on his shoulders and her face right up close to his. Now listen to me, Fudge Hatcher. I made a deal with your mother. I'm going to babys I am going to be your babysitter and your he didn't wait for her to finish. I thought you're gonna be my wife. First, I'm going to be your babysitter, she said, and if that works out, we'll talk about the wedding. After lunch, everyone went off to their afternoon activities, just like at summer camp. Libby went to work at Ickles Ice Cream Parlor. Grandma and Buzzy Sr. went for a hike in Acadio National Park. Mom and Dad took Tootsie to the pond to see the ducks. The Tubmans went to visit friends, and Sheila took Fudge down to the beach. So for once, there was no one around to bother me. No one asked stupid questions. This is the life, I thought, as I stretched out on the hammock in the backyard. I can do anything I feel like doing. I can finish my Gary Paulson book or ride my bicycle out to the lighthouse. 
I looked over at Turtle, who was sleeping in the sun. I could tell he was having a dream by the way his legs and tail twitched. I thought about taking him for a walk. He could use the exercise. Since we got here, he's been sleeping a lot. A walk to the beach would do him good. I jumped up and called, Come on, boy, let's go have some fun. Turtle opened his eyes and looked at me. He yawned. Don't you want to go to the beach? I asked, tugging at his collar. But he still didn't budge. Okay, fine, I told him. Just sit there. I walked away, sure he would follow. But when I turned around back to check to, see if, to check, he would sleep again. Who cares, I thought. I don't need him. I don't need anyone. I can have plenty of fun on my own. I walked through the woods to the beach. Sheila and Fudge were out in front of Mrs. A's house, rock hunting. What a joke. The whole beach is made of pink rocks. When the tide is out, you can walk on rocks for miles. I headed in their direction. First, they didn't notice me. They were too busy choosing rocks to dump in their bucket. So I snuck up right behind Sheila and made a loud barking sound. Roof! Sheila jumped about three feet. She was really mad when she saw it was me. Who invited you? She shouted. It's a public beach, I told her. I don't need an invitation. I want you to know, Peter Hatcher, that even if you spend all day, every day with us, you're not getting a penny of my babysitting money. And I want your money. Then what are you doing here, she asked. Anyone who feels like being here can be here, I told her. So how come you didn't feel like being here before? How come you suddenly feel like it now? I spread my arms wide and sang as loud as I could. Who can explain it? Who can tell why? Fudge started laughing. Don't encourage him, Sheila said. I kept on singing, fools give you reasons, wise men never try. I heard that song last night from Buzzy Sr. and Grandma. It's called Some Enchanted Evening. This is too embarrassing for words, Sheila said. I would have kept on singing, but Mrs. A called from her porch. Yoo-hoo, yoo-hoo, boys, she waved to us. Did you find your uncle? He was at home, Fudge called back. He was hiding. That's a relief. I was worried. What uncle? Sheila asked. Uncle Feather, Fudge said. She thinks it's my real uncle. Why would she think that? Sheila said. She just does, Fudge said. Right, Pete? Yeah, right, I told him. But that doesn't make any sense, Sheila said. A lot of things don't make any sense, Fudge said. Like a bird breather, I thought. Yoo-hoo, Mrs. A called again. Come up and have a snack. Mincy's here. Fudge took off and Sheila panicked. Wait for me, Fudge, she called. She tried to lift the bucket, but the perfect babysitter hadn't stopped to think about how much rocks weigh. Want some help, I asked. I don't need your help, she dumped all the rocks out of the bucket and turned it upside down over them. Worried someone's going to steal your rocks, I said. These rocks are special. Oh, I guess I didn't notice since they're about two zillion more exactly like them. You're helpless, Peter. Really hopeless. That's better than what you are, I called, but I don't think she heard me. She was already running up the beach after fudge. I followed. Not that I wasn't perfectly happy on my own, but why miss out on one of Mrs. A's snacks? Chapter 7. The Best News of the Century Mitzi was taller than fudge, with long hair tied in a ponytail. She wore a baseball glove on her left hand. Mrs. A introduced us to her as soon as we got to the house. This is Fudge Feather, she said, and this is his big brother. She put her finger to her mouth and paused. Mm, Peter, I said, helping her out. I don't know why people can always remember Fudge's name, but not mine. Yes, Mrs. A said. Peter Feather. Feather's a funny name, Mitzi said. Actually, it's Hatcher, I told her, setting the record straight. But I thought your uncle's name is Feather, Mrs. A said. It is, Fudge told her. His first name is Feather, I explained explained before things got any more confusing. Feather Hatcher, Uncle Feather Hatcher. Oh, Mrs. A said laughing. I get it now. So you're the Hatcher boys, not the Feather boys. That's right, I told her. I like Feather better, Mitzi said. And Fudge isn't a name, it's a candy. It's a name too, Fudge told her. Right, Pete? That's right, I said. Doesn't he have another name? Mitzi asked me. A real name? It's Farley, Fudge said. He stuck out his chin, daring her to say anything more. Farley, Mitzi said, opening her eyes really wide. That's a real name? Yes, Fudge said. Grandma, Mitzi said, is Farley a name? It's a beautiful name, Mrs. A said. It was once a handsome movie star named Farley Granger. She closed her eyes and kind of sighed, and then she went into the room to get us a snack. Sheila went with her. As soon as they were gone, Mitzi got shy. She looked at the floor of the porch, and then she looked at the ceiling. She socked her fist into her baseball glove to make the pocket deeper, but she didn't say a word. Fudge watched her and hummed a little tune. 
He didn't have anything to say either. I, st I decided it was up to me to get things going between them, so I said, there's a good-looking baseball glove. I call it my mitt Z, she said, hugging it to her chest. Big gave it to me. Who's big, Fudge asked. My grandpa, Mitzi said. Big Etfel. Big who, I asked. Sure, I'd misunderstood her. Big Etfel, she said again. I couldn't believe this. I kneeled beside her and spoke very softly. Are you telling us your grandfather is Big Etfel, the baseball player? Mitzi nodded. I have his baseball card, I said. I know his stats by heart. You want to play in its game? Mitzi asked. His game, I said. She nodded again. We play every Sunday. Are you saying that anyone who wants to play ball with Big Etfeld can? You have to pass the over-under test first. What's the over-under test? You have to be over four and under 104. And that's it? I asked. That's it, she said. Yahoo! I yelled, jumping as high. I, so high, I almost knocked over one of Mrs. A's hanging plants. This is the best news I've heard in a long time. Is it the best news of the century, Fudge asked. It could be, I told him, as I yahooed again. In a minute, all three of us were jumping up and down and yahooing all over the porch. That's when the perfect babysitter appeared, holding a pitcher of juice. I'm gone for five minutes, she said. Five minutes, and look at you, carrying on like a bunch of monkeys. But honey, Fudge said in his best news of the... It, it's the best news of the century. What's the best news of the century, she asked. Who knows, Fudge said. I don't even know what a century is. I ran all the way home. As soon as I got there, I called Jimmy Fargo. I'm not supposed to make long-distance calls without permission, but this was definitely a special occasion. I was still trying to catch my breath when Jimmy answered. Are you sitting or standing, I asked. Standing? Well, sit down. Okay, he said. I'm sitting. Where, I asked. What's the difference? I want to imagine how you look when I tell you the news. I'm sitting on the floor in the kitchen, Jimmy said, with my back against the refrigerator. Okay, I've got the picture. So what's the story? Jimmy asked. You're never going to believe who our neighbor is up here. I paused for a second and took a deep breath, and then I dropped the news. Big at Phil. Jimmy didn't say anything. You fainted, right? I said. No. But you're speechless. No. You don't believe me? I believe you, Jimmy said. But I don't get it. Did you say Big Atfell is your neighbor or what? I said Big Atfell, Boston Red Sox, the greatest center fielder of all time. Ty Cobb was the greatest center fielder of all time, or maybe Willie Mays. I wasn't going to argue with Jimmy. Instead, I explained that this was a chance for us to play ball with one of the greats. I reminded him to bring his glove and his Mets cap to Maine. Then I waited for him to say something. When he didn't, I asked, are you still coming? Are you still there? I strike out a lot, he finally said. Who doesn't? Probably be Gatville. We're not talking about major leagues. We're talking about your basic Sunday ball game. Speaking of basics, Jimmy said, how's it going with the Queen of Cooties? Ah, I hardly ever see her. She's got a job babysitting. That's really, Jimmy said. I didn't tell her who she was babysitting. I couldn't get to sleep that night. I kept thinking about Jimmy and me playing ball on Big Atfell's team, but that reminded me that Jimmy still doesn't know we're sharing a house with the Tubmans. I have to come up with a good excuse, and soon or I'll never hear the end of it from him. I tossed and turned as Fudge babbled in his sleep. I gave him a kick and he rolled over. After a while, I got out of bed and tiptoed down the hall to the bathroom. It's so quiet in the country and dark. In the city, it's never dark. You can always look out the window and see the lights. It's never quiet either. You can hear the buzz of traffic even in the middle of the night. I used the toilet, then flushed, and that's when it came to me. The perfect excuse for sharing a house with the Tubmans. I flushed again and imagined myself telling Jimmy the long, sad story. I'd say, see, when we first got to Maine, we moved into this big old house. It had seven bedrooms and four bathrooms, and you could see the ocean from every window. But unfortunately, there was a big problem. What problem, Jimmy would ask. Poison gas, I'd say. Poison gas in all the toilets. Green, steamy, gurgling stuff that bubbled up every time we flushed. Blech, Jimmy would say, making a terrible face. Dad had to call the health inspector. I'd continue. She took one look and went nuts. This is a disaster, she cried. This is a serious environmental hazard disaster. So then what? Jimmy would ask, biting his nails. She 
condemned the place. Even though she was sorry about ruining our vacation, she had no choice. The police came and boarded up the house. They nailed a sign on the front door. Warning, poison gas in toilets. Flush at your own risk. Wow, Jimmy would say. You're lucky you got out alive. And I'd say, yeah, I know. Brilliant story. I told myself as I turned out the bathroom lights. Jimmy's very big on environmental issues. He's got posters all over his room. Save the whales, save the dolphins, save the rainforest. So he'll understand that the Tubmans were just trying to save our vacation when they let us share their house. I went back to my room and got into bed. This time I had no trouble falling asleep.